we are getting started. And as I mentioned, we will have about 45 to 50 minutes worth of information to share. And that leaves us 10 to 15 minutes or more of questions. I know Healthy Planet, you're always a keen audience with lots of great questions. So I'm happy to take those. Uh, unfortunately, I can't take them as we go along um, because that can get distracting. But if you have a question as we go along, feel free to type it into the Q&A area. And I will go through those at the end of the presentation. So, and what are we talking about? What might you be asking questions about? Well, spring your way to better energy and vitality, specifically uh, fatigue, what causes it, how to get your energy and vitality back naturally. It's a great topic for the springtime, and especially after the year we've had, I think it's, this is a special, uh, especially time. A few words about myself. I am naturopathic Dr. Kate Rayom. I am the uh, author of this book, Vitamin K2 and the Calcium Paradox, How a Little-Known Vitamin Could Save Your Life. I am a graduate and former faculty member of the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto. And I'm an inactive member, which means a member in good standing with my professional association, but not currently seeing patients or taking patients, sorry. And among other things, I'm a busy working mom and an educator with Factors Group, Natural Factors, which is what brings me here tonight to talk about the probably single most common complaint uh, or one of them, one of the top three that people make to their doctors, which is fatigue. So we're going to talk about what fatigue is, its possible causes, looking at the various strategies available to support our energy and vitality, uh, including specifically key nutrition tips and nutrients to help support energy production and how to deal and address with specific causes of fatigue. Now, we aren't able to discuss or cover every single cause of fatigue because there are so many of them. Fatigue can be described as not just a feeling of tiredness, of course, that's obvious, tiredness, reduced energy, exhaustion is all under this umbrella, but also lack of motivation can fall under this umbrella. It, as I mentioned, is one of the most common complaints people make to their doctors, and generally it is actually secondary to some other kind of concern, although there's an important exception to that that I'm going to get onto later. Uh, but for the, for the most part, there is some underlying cause to the fatigue, and like I said, it's secondary to something else going on, so I'll try to identify and look at a few of those. Uh, we can't do them all because there are literally hundreds of reasons why somebody could feel fatigued. Um, but fatigue will generally affect people between the ages of 20 to 50 years old. It's rare in people under 20 years of age, and usually that is a sign that they have either an infection or some kind of condition that needs to be addressed. And counterintuitively, fatigue and complaints of fatigue become slightly less common in people over 50 years old. In other words, you think you don't um, feel more tired necessarily with age or, or be exhausted, for example, more often. Um, but in that midlife, we do tend to see this quite a bit. Okay, so here are some specific conditions that cause fatigue um, and a number of relatively common underlying reasons that can be contributing to fatigue. Uh, anemia or low iron, and we'll touch on that later. Blood sugar problems. Uh, arthritis, any kind of itis, in other words, any kind of inflammation of the body can rob you of your energy. Certainly adrenal dysfunction, which is secondary to stress. Uh, thyroid problems, mitochondrial dysfunction that I have here in red is, is one we'll be focusing on. And, um, you know, an imbalance of any neurotransmitter or hormone can have this effect, certain medications, environmental sensitivities, uh, a number of chronic diseases, infections, cancer, of course. Uh, and psychological or lifestyle factors include stress can absolutely zap your energy, no doubt about that. And I think everybody has experienced that to some extent over the last year. Uh, of course, depression, anxiety, mood problems are often accompanied by fatigue and naturally insufficient sleep. So if you're not sleeping well, then that's a major uh, for cause of fatigue. Um, imbalanced nutrition, and there are certain key, very common in nutritional imbalances that contribute to fatigue that I'm going to touch on. Either insufficient or excessive physical activity, that's important or any kind of work-life imbalance, which usually means, of course, stress. 
So I am going to spend a little bit more time on the bold or, or highlighted uh, items here, things like uh, blood sugar. Um, oh, I will touch on sleep. I know we had a whole hour webinar last month um, on that topic, and it's one that's always popular because I know lots of people aren't sleeping. So because that's so such an important contributor to fatigue, I will touch on it at the end of this hour. Um, as well as, you know, the kind of fatigue when we mean you just don't feel like you have the kind of energy that you used to sort of thing. That's something that uh, I'll definitely cover. So how can we spring our way to better energy and vitality? Well, um, sleep support, physical movement, nutrition and nutrient support, mitochondrial support, our big ones, of course, balancing hormones, thyroid support and adrenal, that hormonal aspect of it is also important, but I don't have time to cover all that in one evening. So we're going to leave the items in blue here and focus more on the uh, things in green, which are, you know, general things we can do to increase, identify a few specific causes of fatigue and increase our overall energy. Okay, so let us start with exercise. Now this may seem like a no brainer, but I would absolutely be remiss not to mention it. Think of this as a prescription, not something that would be nice to get to if you had the chance or whatever, but exercise literally does increase our energy uh, levels. And that is because when we exercise, we typically boost our metabolism, specifically when we're doing um, weight bearing and strength training exercises by uh, building and maintaining your muscles through weight bearing exercise, you are creating more mitochondria and mitochondria are the batteries of all of our cells. And so it's, maybe it's counterintuitive because you think you're using up energy while you're exercising. And of course you are a little, but you're also upregulating or jacking up your energy production mechanism. So it actually ultimately leads to greater energy. Um, and so if you think that you are too tired to exercise, uh, that can become a vicious cycle. And in fact, exercise will help you create or make more energy. So think of it literally as a prescription, not something that's optional, but something that you need to do on a regular basis. If you can get out for a 20 minute walk per day, that's ideal. Um, or, you know, it, you know, 30 minutes, three to five times a week, pick a specific number and stick with it. If you are suffering with any, you know, chronic condition or ailment that, um, in, you know, might impede heart condition, you name it, um, your ability to exercise, do speak with your doctor before you go exercising. But exercise does help balance hormones, improve insulin res resistance, sleep, which ultimately has further effects on energy, uh, stamina, mood, uh, exercise is a great mood booster. And so there's all sorts of direct and indirect ways it will enhance your energy. Anything you can do to get moving is helpful. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about nutrition and nutrient support. So there are specific, very common nutritional habits, I guess you could say, um, that really will affect your energy throughout the day. And the most common one is fluctuations in your blood sugar. So this is even for people who are non-diabetic. So if you are, are, have not been diagnosed with diabetes or high blood sugar, you can still be having blood sugar that's fluctuating up and down all day long. So you can see the little cartoon here on the top. The processed sugar ride. And this typically starts with breakfast, uh, unfortunately, because what are commonly accepted breakfast foods, think things like bagels and muffins and pancakes and cereal and waffles and even oatmeal to a certain extent uh, for some people and depending on what, if, you know, if you're putting sugar on it. All of these are high glycemic index foods, which you get your blood sugar skyrocketing up very early in the day and what goes up must come down. And so when your blood sugar goes up and it's, is high, uh, that's not good for you, but it doesn't feel bad. It's when your blood sugar then starts to drop down after that bump that you will start to feel bad. Um, as blood sugar drops, uh, your energy can drop with it. This may be accompanied by cravings that after three o'clock, a typical afternoon slump where you feel like you need a coffee and a muffin, which will just exacerbate this process. Um, and also when your blood sugar is dropping fast enough, your body perceives this as a stress 
and produces adrenaline in response to that. So anybody who's ever experienced being hangry, um, that is absolutely the adrenaline boost that you get when your blood sugar is dropping. And so this is an added stressor on the body, which can further rob you of your energy. So this up and down blood sugar. Instead, if you can keep your blood sugar more stable and the food choices you make will really affect that, and especially what you eat at the beginning of the day, what you eat at breakfast sets the tone for your blood sugar for the rest of the day, which sets the tone for your energy, your cravings, and even your sleep the following night. And so um, this kind of smoother or less bumpy blood sugar can really affect uh, or help reduce some of the causes of fatigue. So things that help to, or foods, types of foods that help to keep your blood sugar stable are obviously not sugar. So avoid those sweet and starchy foods for breakfast. Instead, reach for protein, fat, and fiber. So I'm specifically gonna talk about uh, a little bit about protein uh, because having adequate protein not only stabilizes your blood sugar, but it really helps support energy in a number of ways. First of all, when you're stabilizing your blood sugar, you're stabilizing your appetite, you're reducing cravings, which further prevents more blood sugar fluctuation. It helps to boost your metabolism because it helps you, um, eating enough protein helps you maintain your lean muscle mass, and that is really what maintains your metabolism. So in, uh, maintain and increase muscle mass and strength, bone strength, um, helping to promote healthy brain function because the amino acids from that protein make neurotransmitters, uh, supporting for a, a recovery from injury, uh, lots of important things with protein and a uh, great way to start your day always includes some protein with your breakfast, whether it's eggs, Greek yogurt, um, a smoothie, for example, with uh, you can get a lot of protein in there. How much protein do you need? Well, the very simple equation that you can do without a calculator is one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So to use myself as an example, last time I weighed myself, I was about 135 pounds. That would mean I'd need to eat 135 grams of protein per day. Now that isn't easy. It doesn't happen on its own or it doesn't happen without certainly some thought and planning and maybe a few high protein snacks. Um, but using a more conservative number that you might need a calculator for, uh, 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So again, using myself as an example, that works out to around 108 grams of protein per day. So divide that up, I'm looking at 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal and maybe a few grams thrown into a snack here or there. So again, that does um, require some planning. And uh, maintaining this kind of protein intake, really important for preventing muscle loss with age, which is an important part of preventing frailty, maintaining independence. There's lots of long-term uh, benefits. But in the short term, as we're talking about tonight, it helps to support um, your energy levels. So because that's quite a significant number, either 0.8, either 0 0.8 or one gram of protein per pound of body weight, um, it really does make a difference to have a protein, a quick, easy protein source that you can throw in another 20 grams of protein in either a snack or a meal, especially if you're on the go. And so a protein supplement is really very handy and convenient. There's lots of different ones on the market. Um, whey proteins are very common. Uh, the two big categories I would say would be whey proteins and plant-based proteins. So uh, for people following a plant-based diet or just looking for either added protein from plant-based sources, this happens more easily with a supplement because plants are not whole, uh, what are called whole proteins. Any individual plant doesn't contain all the essential amino acids required to make a whole protein. You have to combine them. And so with the plant-based protein supplement, uh, scientists have done that work for you to make sure you have all the amino acids you need for muscle building and all the other protein benefits. So here's an example, veggie day, raw organic vegan protein will, each scoop will provide 20 grams of easily digestible complete protein from a combination of raw non-GMO plants, nuts, seeds, legumes, for example. And this can easily be mixed uh, either in water or juice and just had like that as a snack 
or put into a shake if you want to add in you know, extra veggies and fat and fiber and whatever other things you like to add into your smoothie. And this is just, uh, I find a, a, a great way to help uh, meet your protein requirements. Okay, so next moving on, I mentioned that to keep your blood sugar levels stable, which keeps your energy stable throughout the day, protein, fat, and fiber. So when we talk about fat, there's probably not a single nutrient or macronutrient or part of our diet that has been as controversial over the last several decades as fat. You know, should you have a low fat diet? Should you have a high fat diet? What type of fat is healthy? What type of fat is unhealthy? That's has changed so much. And I still hear some fat phobia out there. Some people who feel like, um, you know, a low fat diet maybe is the way to go or something along those lines. Uh, around the new year, you still see ads for egg white omelets at various restaurants. Um, and that just comes from the concept that the, you know, uh, fat in the yolks is somehow not healthy for you, which couldn't be further from the truth. And the fact is we all need fat it helps to build and maintain all aspects of our health. It is really important for absorption of fat soluble nutrients. It's really important for balancing hormones, which is an important part of our energy levels, maintaining a healthy body weight, um, supporting cardiovascular immune, eye health, you name it. And it's a great source of energy. So you can get, uh, you know, when we talk about fats, we want to zoom in and hone in on omega-3 essential fatty acids because this specific type of fat is, well, essential as the name implies means we absolutely need this in through our diet. We can't make it ourselves. And it happens to be one that is one of the most challenging fats to get in through our diet. And that's because omega-3 essential fatty acids comes from one of a few sources. There's animal-based, and that includes potentially or particularly grass-fed animal foods, so egg yolks, butter, the fat of animals that are out on the pasture will have more omega-3s. If those animals have been grain-fed, which is much more common, the fats that you'll find in there are more omega-6s, which we have plenty of in our diet. So that's grass-fed animal foods. Deep cold water fish, so salmon, mackerels, anchovies, sardine, herring, these have the long chain omega-3 essential fatty acids that we absorb and utilize quite readily. And lots of research on the benefits of these. Unfortunately, you can't eat fish every day, uh, even if it's wild caught from an environmental standpoint, even, uh, you know, uh, those fish are high in environmental toxins, the larger fish, especially things like salmon and herring. The smaller ones like sardines and anchovies, because just from being smaller, they will accumulate less toxins, um, but you have to eat a lot of anchovies uh, to get a decent amount of omega-3s. Uh, the third place we will get omega-3s is from plants. There are plants like flax seeds, chia seeds, for example, that do contain omega-3s, uh, but those are a different form. Those are short chain omega-3s that your body needs to stick together to make the long chain, what are called EPA and DHA that we need for our health. And the extent to which you can do that, that conversion really varies per person and you can't necessarily depend on that. So super important for omega-3s uh, to help um, increase a leptin secretion, which is an appetite suppressant. Um, having enough omega-3s helps us burn our stored fats and fuels more efficiently, um, helps decrease inflammation, which is a real uh, fit, um, energy robber, and a really important part of blood sugar control, as I mentioned, improving insulin sensitivity. These are all important aspects of general health that also contribute to our energy levels. So if you're going to be choosing an, uh, an omega-3 supplement, then quality uh, varies quite a bit from ones that you will find on the market. And so there's certain things to look for. So here's an example, the Seelicious Omega-3. This happens to be a high EPA uh, form of uh, purified fish oil. Big advantage that a fish oil supplement has over just eating fish is that uh, these are purified to remove the environmental contaminants that you'd normally find in fish. And so that's, you can get the benefits of the omega-3s on a daily basis without uh, exposing yourself to the environmental contaminants. 
And so the Celicious high EPA omega-3 offers a two to one ratio of the two major omega-3 fats, EPA to DHA. These have different benefits. Um, EPA is important for supporting mood. And so I especially like this one for people who are kind of having the blues uh, or low mood. Um, along with the omega-3 essential fats, you have uh, vitamin D, as well as astaxanthin, which is uh, a fantastic antioxidant for skin, eyes, brain, you name it, and green tea extract. So just one teaspoon per day provides usually adequate amounts of omega-3 for most people year-round. Some people might want more in the wintertime, uh, but most people are covered year-round with even just a teaspoon. And it's tasty, which when things are tasty, you remember to take them. Uh, it also comes, there, there are a variety of other Celicious SKUs. It does come in soft gel capsules for people who um, prefer taking their fish oil in a soft gel capsule. Okay, so let's move on to looking at specific nutrients and how they contribute to our energy levels. Because a deficiency of any individual nutrient, a shortage, could potentially affect our energy levels. But there are certain nutrients that, in particular, um, if they're low, they will um, be you know, energy robbers, and that will show up as fatigue is one of the symptoms, and that are uh, fairly commonly low, and they can often underlie fatigue. Uh, and these deficiencies, by the way, can come around due to malabsorption uh, for a number of reasons, or especially well, you know, when as people are aging, they can change the way they absorb nutrients, or simply insufficient intake through the diet, whether because the foods that we're eating are lower in these nutrients, because we know soils are becoming depleted in minerals in particular. Um, or, uh, or just somebody with a low appetite or an unbalanced diet, or depletions by medication, um, other conflicting food or beverages that compete with the absorption of nutrients. Stress will actually rob us of certain nutrients. For example, when you're under stress, you deplete magnesium very quickly and magnesium levels will drop and that will affect energy levels. So these are some of the examples or reasons why we can be low in certain nutrients that's contributing to fatigue. First one I'll talk about, and I talk about this because it's potentially the, a very important nutrient for energy levels, but um, not necessarily for everyone. So uh, I think one of my pet peeves is, and I'm sure everybody has seen this at one point or another, the kinds of ads that say, feeling tired, take some iron. Um, you should never take an iron supplement. Well, let me correct that. Most people shouldn't take an iron supplement unless they have a blood test to show they are low in iron. And by most people, I mean all men and postmenopausal women. For women who are still in their reproductive years, still menstruating and therefore losing blood and iron every month, it's okay to have iron in your multi, for example, that's uh, a good thing to have in there. But one thing that distinguishes uh, a multi for women to women 50 plus or women to men of any age um, is that women's multi, for example, would contain iron and the other formulas would be iron free because unless you have low iron levels, you shouldn't take iron because iron can build up in the body if you're not losing it regularly. And that's problematic. Uh, it's a pro-oxidant. It can essentially thicken the blood. Um, so do not assume you need iron or that iron will fix your low energy. Now, if you happen to be, you know, if you're, like I said, a woman in reproductive cycle, especially somebody who is following a vegan or vegetarian diet, you have a history of low iron, that's one thing. Uh, but for the most part, I don't like people taking iron supplements unless they uh, have had a test to say they're low in iron. Now, if that's the case and you are low in iron, uh, taking an iron supplement can make a, you know, can be life changing. Uh, but don't assume on the iron. Okay, next, B vitamins. B vitamins are critical for energy support because they are used by the body to convert the food that we eat into the energy that we use at the cellular level. So all of our food contains stored energy, as we know, calories that ultimately come from the sun. And then our body uses uh, enzymes to convert that to ATP, which is our cellular energy. And we need B vitamins to do that. 
And so a deficiency of any individual B vitamin can potentially impact energy production. And um, a deficiency of certain Bs in particular can make you feel tired. Vitamin B12 is one of them. For some longstanding vegans and vegetarians, because uh, B12 is just about impossible to get in that kind of diet. Um, you know, the life-changing effects of getting, for example, a B12 shot or starting to take a sublingual B12 can be remarkable. Um, but other Bs also participate in energy production. So B vitamins, as a you know, just implied, are found primarily in protein-rich food like uh, beef, fish, eggs, um, poultry, uh, but you can also find them in lesser amounts in uh, greens, grains, legumes, uh, those kinds of things. But a B vitamin is a really, uh, either on its own or as, you know, part of a good multivitamin, is a great thing to consider if your energy is just sort of not what it used to be in general. Um, you know, you're sleeping well and everything else is okay, but it's there. It, these are great stress busters and great energy support in general. Okay, so as I already sort of touched on, you know, we looked at lots of specific types of fatigue um, because of specific causes, but what if that type of sort of lack of energy in which you just feel like you don't have the kind of get up and go that you used to or the kind of energy that you used to. Well, this is when we want to look and, and sort of zoom in on, we talk about energy, what does that mean? Where is it being made? And what can we do to get it made uh, more efficiently? I already sort of hinted at that when I talked about exercise, because exercise helps us create more mitochondria. And mitochondria, as I'm sure you have heard, are the batteries of all of our cells. So literally every cell in our body needs energy to live and do its thing. And so that energy comes from within the cell, these tiny little bean-shaped um, energy producers that you can think of as batteries for every single cell. Um, some cells need more energy than others, like the heart, it's always beating, and the brain, it's always thinking, even when we're sleeping, uh, those, the cells of those organs are very rich in mitochondria, um, whereas other cells, like fat cells, mostly are just sitting around not doing a whole heck of a lot. They still have mitochondria, but not quite as many. And the level of the mitochondria in our cells can decrease with age, with stress due to genetic factors, uh, lack of nutrients to support them. And if your mitochondria are decreasing in quality or quantity, well, their ability to produce energy and therefore your energy and sense of energy will be affected. So mitochondrial dysfunction is uh, a characteristic of aging, as I mentioned, and essentially all chronic diseases. Um, and in addition to poor diet and or nutrient deficiencies, uh, environmental toxins uh, can affect your mitochondria and their function, inflammation, stress, sleep, in addition to, you know, robbing you of sleep also affects your mitochondria. So there's sort of a double whammy when it comes to your energy levels. Having a sedentary lifestyle, because as I mentioned, exercise increases your mitochondria, uh, a number of prescription drugs, there's lots of factors that can affect these little energy producers. So here is a, a cartoon depiction of a mitochondria. They're often shown as these bean shaped structures. Again, you will have, you know, you can have hundreds to thousands of them inside a cell, depending on what the cell is, where it is, what it's doing. And um, they have this little wrinkled membrane. And what happens is electrons are passed uh, down and across this mem uh, membrane. And that uh, passing of electrons helps to generate the energy that we need, the ATP that we need. And um, as this very, you know, fairly complicated looking chart shows, just about any nutrient from our diet, directly or indirectly, uh, contributes to or affects the function of the mitochondria. So if you're deficient in vitamin C, D, E, uh, B, selenium, zinc, lycopene, you know, all of these things, that can potentially impact your mitochondria. So in other words, having a nutrient-dense um, 
diet uh, that is full of, uh, you know, as many different nutrients, uh, nutrition rich as, as it can be, is helpful for our energy production because of this reason. Um, also ways to support the mitochondria that you have uh, already uh, is to, well, optimize maternal DNA. That's a, it's a bit of a tongue in cheek um, because you inherit, although you inherit genetic material from both your mother and your father, your mitochondria become exclusively from your mom. So pick a good mom as a way to get better mitochondria. Um, in case you're past that point, decreasing toxin exposure. So those can be things around your house. That's where we have control over the toxins. Uh, avoiding plastics and fragrances are major ways you can reduce your toxic exposure within your own home. Um, you know, so picking unscented things, um, uh, you know, uh, instead of those scented dryer sheets, use like a wool dryer ball, use reusable um, uh, grocery bags and produce bags that plastic bags, all that kind of thing. So reducing toxin exposure, providing the nutrients that one, help to feed the mitochondria as well, two, protecting them from oxidative stress. So as I mentioned, electrons are bouncing around here as, it, as these things make energy and where you have electrons bouncing around, you have free radicals. And so mitochondria are actually the main generators of free radicals within each cell. Uh, now for that reason, they often have built in antioxidant mechanisms, uh, but anything you can do to support and enhance those mechanisms will protect your mitochondria from becoming damaged by their own energy production. Um, and as I've mentioned a few times before, building your muscle mass will increase mitochondria and your energy production. So which nutrients, by the way, um, I showed some general ones and there's other ones that you've probably already heard of and familiar. I'm sure everybody has heard of CoQ10 and you probably already knew that it worked in the mitochondria um, because sometimes CoQ10 is called the cellular spark plug. So in those little engines that are the mitochondria, the CoQ10 helps to throw and catch the electrons as they move around. Um, so CoQ10, really important for, um, feeding, supporting, and protecting the mitochondria. CoQ10 is also a fantastic antioxidant. Another nutrient, which is an amino acid, which is helpful, is acetyl L-carnitine. Um, so acetyl L-carnitine uh, is sometimes called the fat bus. It will take fatty acids and shuttle them into the mitochondria so they can be burned for energy. So as you might imagine, yes, people take this for weight loss because it helps encourage fat burning, uh, but it also helps to fuel the brain. Uh, specifically, this acetyl L form uh, will help to create energy in the brain. Um, so it's included in a number of uh, you know, brain formulas. There are other nutrients that you may be less familiar with, but as I mentioned, any antioxidant, and there's a few big ones. Glutathione is one of our major antioxidant systems in the body, as well as superoxide dismutase. Uh, it's another major antioxidant to protect uh, mitochondria. And so all of these nutrients I mentioned here can be found in this brand new product called Regener Life. So it's a combination of uh, target nutrients that have been shown to help optimize um, the mitochondria help to increase ATP levels without increasing free radicals. So uh, you increase energy without increasing free radicals is uh, a fantastic combination. So in addition to the CoQ10, acetyl L-carnitine, superoxide dismutase, L-glutathione, uh, there is a uh, an extract of sustainable peat and apples, something called Elevate TP, which has been shown as well to support energy levels. Um, this is stimulant free. So it's a way to support your energy that is not caffeine, for example, um, which is a bit of a false energy boost and uh, suitable for vegetarians. You can take a scoop of this in the morning or a scoop of this, for example, before a workout, it's just, it's a tiny little scoop, a little bit of powder. Uh, this features a natural watermelon flavor. It's sweetened with stevia and you can put it in a little bit of um, a drink and you'd have this typically on a daily basis for a minimum of four weeks to see beneficial effects, but some people will report that more sustained energy or better workout kind of thing um, quite quickly.
So this is something that's new, it's unique, and it provides a really powerful combination of mitochondrial supportive nutrients. So for people who are noticing that just uh, like decreased energy levels, sort of in general, you're sleeping okay. Okay, everybody's under some stress for sure, but you just sort of need that extra boost or sustained energy. And this is absolutely something to consider supporting your mitochondria. Okay, so next, let us touch briefly on sleep support. Because as I mentioned, and what's obvious is if you're not sleeping well, you're gonna feel tired. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. And uh, lots of sleep uh, complaints. Sleep quality and quantity are important for your uh, lowering your biological age, for example. And we know that not sleeping leads to more stress, which leads to less sleep. So research has shown that after only one night of restricted sleep, cortisol levels, your stress hormone levels go up. And when stress hormone levels are up, that pushes your melatonin levels down, which leads to more sleep problems. And so this it can become a vicious cycle. And this is one way in which when we're under stress, we don't sleep as well because our cortisol suppresses our, our melatonin. And um, this is a problem that needs to be sort of a cycle that needs to be broken. So how do we get a better night's sleep? First of all, you have to pay attention to sleep hygiene. Now, this doesn't mean taking a shower before bed. Sleep hygiene refers to all of the habits that we can establish to help to optimize or maintain a better circadian rhythm. So that's a better sleep-wake, day-night uh, production of the hormones that should help us uh, sleep at night and wake up in the morning. So sleeping and waking at the same time every day, really important for establishing this rhythm. Sleeping in a dark room or using um, a sleep mask if necessary, that darkness helps to enhance your natural melatonin production. Conversely, being exposed to light on waking. It's nice that the sun's coming up earlier in the morning now. I know that's making it easier on all of us, but still, you know, put your blind up first thing in the morning, or if the sun's still not up, um, then, you know, turn on the lights. You can buy special lights for this, but you don't necessarily need to. As much as possible, you know, get outside, even if it's for a few minutes, expose yourself to some sunshine between six and eight in the morning, just even looking. That light exposure early in the day, uh, again, helps to set the daily rhythm. Sleeping in a cool room, that cool environment, the drop in body temperature helps induce sleep. Avoiding screens and blue lights before bed. So blue lights that come out of uh, laptops, phones, TVs, all of that sends a message to your brain to produce less melatonin. Avoid naps. If you're not sleeping well at night, avoid as much as you can the temptation to nap during the day or at least keep it to less than 20 minutes. If you sleep more than 20 minutes, you get into a deeper stage of sleep. And if you're doing deep sleep during the day, you will do less of it at night. Um, avoiding screens while in bed, just the habit of being in bed on your phone. Uh, consider white noise. So rather than sleeping in a completely quiet room, uh, you know, you can turn on some kind of machine, like whether it's a fan or a humidifier or dehumidifier. And it's amazing what that hum can do. Once you get used to it, that hum, by tuning that out, you seem to, you can tune everything else. And this, those can work really well. I think you can get white noise apps for your phone uh, as well. Trying to sleep on a relatively empty stomach. Um, you know, there's some finer points to this, but you know, for the most part, we all know if you've had a big heavy meal, uh, you're not going to sleep well. Um, now, conversely, if you're doing intermittent fasting and you go to bed too hungry, you actually, and your blood sugar is dropping and your adrenaline's up, you might not sleep as well. So that's a different scenario. But um, for the most part, sleeping on a, a relatively empty stomach is a good thing. And finally, minimize caffeine. Sounds like a no brainer, but you'd be amazed the amount of people who claim that they aren't sleeping well and they're drinking eight cups of coffee per day. There is a connection between those things. So if you're not sleeping well, I would say no caffeine after three at the latest, maybe noon, uh, as well as alcohol, especially red wine is notorious for making you feel sleepy at first and then waking you up later. Okay. 
And then there is natural sleep help. So there are certain nutrients that are safe, gentle, effective, not habit forming, help you uh, go to sleep faster, uh, sleep more soundly, wake up feeling refreshed and not groggy or hungover the next day. So here is an example of a combination that Tranquil Sleep contains just three nutrients, L-theanine, melatonin, and 5-HTP. Uh, L-theanine was originally identified in green tea, and it is a nutrient that actually in and of itself doesn't cause drowsiness. You can get L-theanine on its own to, to take during the day for anxiety, for example, uh, but it's really nice for calming down the overactive mind, and it does help improve sleep quality. Uh, as well as melatonin, of course, is the famous sleep hormone. Um, so, and people produce naturally less melatonin with age. And so uh, for some people that can be really make a big difference with sleep. One of the most common questions I get asked, I don't know why with melatonin, um, almost always, and not as many uh, uh, with other nutrients is, will taking melatonin impede my own melatonin production? Um, no. Melatonin is something that can be safely taken on a long term. Our, our own natural melatonin declines with age anyway. Um, you're not speeding up that process or accelerating that, or it's, it's not habit forming, uh, for example. So that's uh, safe. And 5-HTP, uh, quite a small amount in this product, but it, this is a, a nutrient that's a precursor to melatonin and serotonin. And so it helps uh, you make your own. Now, one nice thing about the tranquil sleep is that it can be taken as needed. So you don't have to take it every night. Um, if you know you lie down in bed and realize mm, this is one of those nights I'm not going to sleep, you can get up and take it, or you can take it on a regular basis. I really like this for teens who have a hard time unwinding after gaming or you know all the screen time they're doing right now, um, helping to maintain. Um, a reasonable bedtime, which can go off the rails with all the homeschooling. So I really like that. My own son has been taking this for a number of years. He's 16 now, but he's been taking this for many years, actually, at bedtime, um, fairly regularly. And this is just an, a nice overall sleep combination um, that is uh, something to have on hand in your natural medicine cabinet, because I think most of us have nights that we don't sleep well, occasionally at least. Okay, so that is sort of an overview and that brings us up to 8.45 as planned um, to looking at different ways of supporting uh, our energy and vitality. So level one support is eating enough protein, fiber, healthy fat to keep our blood sugar level stable. Uh, a multivitamin is a great idea just to make sure you don't have a shortfall of any specific nutrient. Iron supplementation, if needed, um, physical movement, of course, relaxation, anti-stressing. And then level two support would be the use of everything I already mentioned, plus specific nutrients for boosting energy, like the Regenerolife combination to support mitochondrial health and or B vitamins. And then third, um, adaptogens, if you're really under stress, I didn't talk a lot about those tonight. Uh, but of course, any time that you're not sleeping, you can include natural sleep support. Okay, so there's a sort of a brief look and overview of top supplements for energy, protein, healthy fat, active B vitamins, mitochondrial support, sleep support. I didn't really touch much on magnesium, but that's a nutrient, especially when we're under stress um, that can be depleted that can affect our energy. One of the things that, you know, I showed uh, products from different brands, Veggie Day, Celicious, uh, Natural Factors. Uh, one of the things that all these various brands have in common is that they're tested by a company called Aishura. You can check out the website at aishura.ca. Uh, and this is Canada's only independent, not-for-profit natural health supplement and product verification organization. Uh, so for people who say, how do I know I'm getting a good natural health product? How do I know I'm getting, you know, exactly what it says on the label and nothing else, no unpleasant surprises. This is how you know. Um, and it is contaminants testing above and beyond even strict Canadian guidelines testing for I think at this point about 600 different contaminants, as well as testing for um, GMOs to make sure those aren't in the product. The product is uh, 
properly and accurately labeled. Canada is quite good when it comes to these standards, but I sure kind of takes it up a level. Okay, so that brings us up to time and uh, time for questions. So let me go up to the questions here. Okay. Let me go here. Then. Okay, so first question here. Uh, what do you recommend when you wake up feeling unrefreshed? Okay, great question. So there's a few things that can be happening when you wake up feeling unrefreshed. So is it your sleep quality that is um, poor that can contribute to that? Um, one of the first things I recommend for people who are waking up unrefreshed is not eating too close to bedtime, as I sort of alluded to or touched on that. That can be a very simple thing, making sure that you're not eating after, say, 8 p.m. at night. Um, that on its own can sometimes be uh, make a real improvement in waking up more refreshed. Beyond that, um, you have to consider your sleep quality. So are you waking up more, more refreshed even though you think you had a good night's sleep, you're still feeling groggy? or was your sleep choppy and, and you're waking up feeling unrefreshed. So that I can't get into more details, but so the, the one thing I can suggest is um, that not eating too close to bedtime. Uh, how do you exercise if you feel too fatigued too? That's a great question. And um, I guess the, the idea is to start doing something, anything, whatever you can do, whether it's just getting up and walking around the house and then walking to the end of the driveway and back or walking the street, just doing something. And um, initially you may find, of course, it's a challenge or you feel winded or, or um, you know, out of breath, but then over time, just small amounts of what you can do safely that build up can um, help you, you know, stick with exercise. Do drinking protein shakes make you gain weight or can it help you lose weight? So in general, actually, uh, having a higher protein intake is associated with weight loss. Um, you can maintain muscle mass, which helps to maintain your metabolism. So actually, I guess more accurately or specifically, it's associated with fat loss. Now, it depends on what else is going into your shake. <laughs> There's, uh, if you're just having a general you know, high calorie diet, that's one thing. But more protein intake and, and you know, protein supplements are generally associated with weight loss. Omegas are not recommended with blood thinners is a question mark. Um, so omega-3 essential fatty acids do have natural healthy blood thinning properties, but they are not technically contraindicated typically with uh, blood thinners that you may be taking. But, you know, check your medication uh, and check your, the, the bottles uh, of the omegas are, are very specific, but they're not generally contraindicated. It uh, would be like saying somebody who is, um, uh, taking a blood thinner can eat fish, for example, but that's typically not advised. Is omega-3 from fish better or cod liver? Which one is, is best for a 64-year-old man? Well, um, usually with the cod liver, that is a good source of vitamins A and D, the cod liver oils, good source of vitamins A and D, but the actual omega-3s you get from a cod liver oil can vary quite a bit. And so I generally recommend uh, an omega-3 supplement because then you know you're getting the amount of the healthy fats you want um, and you can get your vitamins A and D from other sources. Please comment if eggs are inflammatory. No, they aren't. Eggs and egg yolks, uh, for most individuals, I mean, there's always rare exceptions if you have sensitivity to eggs, but for the most part are um, healthy, anti-inflammatory. The yolks in particular have a number of very important nutrients, vitamin B12, all the B, most of the B vitamins, choline, um, healthy fats, um, in, important. Does the smell from essential oils considered to be toxic? No, natural essential oils are not the same as, uh, when I said fragrances, I meant synthetic or artificial fragrances, uh, but natural essential oils are fine. Um, 
Oh, CoQ10, is this like a regular supplement like vitamin C or D, or is it more like iron? Should it be blood tested? No, you don't need to take a blood test before you take CoQ10. Uh, it's not toxic. It doesn't accumulate. Um, it's uh, not something that needs to be measured. Good question. Um, Vita says, thank you for the webinar. You're welcome. Uh, in terms of relieving body pain, tension, and stress on the body, would chiropractic adjustments help one feel more energized and less tired? Yes, potentially, absolutely. If you have um, restrictions, um, subluxations as they're called, so uh, restrictions uh, in and around the body, potentially chiropractic treatment that helps to loosen them, helps you move better, which helps you stay moving, um, could uh, be helpful. Uh, let me see. Other uh, one other question. What's the best way to improve my memory? Oh, there's so many things. Um, you know, if I had to pick one thing that I was speaking about already this evening, those nutrients that support mitochondrial health, things like CoQ10, L-carnitine in specific. Um, so because the brain, as I mentioned, is such an energy hungry organ, it has tons of mitochondria and you need to support those with age. And so supporting your mitochondria is a great way to support your brain health. Uh, now, specifically with regards to memory, I could do a whole evening on that. Uh, but just, you know, to keep it simple in terms of what I talked about tonight, omega-3s are important for brain health. Um, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but supporting your mitochondria is, is also good. Can I put Regenerolife supplement in my morning shake? Is it safe for daily use? Yes, it is safe for daily use. And specifically, it's recommended to use it for four weeks to see optimum or maximum uh, benefits. Here we go. Mm. There's one here said something about switching ashwagandha to andrographis, and I don't quite understand the question. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to uh, skip over that one. What's your recommendation on uh, a good multivitamin for women over 50? Great question. I really like the whole earth and sea women's multi, women's 50 plus multi. They've got a nice men's and men's 50 plus version as well, but that's the whole earth and sea comes in a, like a green box with lots of plants and flowers on it. Um, Oh, here's a good question. I have been taking health supplements for over two decades. Should I be concerned about magnesium stearate, which is added to so many supplements interfering with my absorption of nutrients? No, the concerns around magnesium stearate, I haven't heard this question in a long time. Um, they are fairly overblown and based on somewhat specious reasoning. In other words, it seems superficially plausible. When you get digging, you realize there isn't a lot to it. Um, there used to be concern that somehow that would interfere with nutrient absorption. Magnesium stearate, by the way, is an ingredient that is used as a, a flow agent. So as you're putting, say, powder into a capsule, if things don't get clogged up, um, it's present in small amounts. You get more of it, more. This is based on concerns around stearic acid, but these two are very different. And um, I, I'm not concerned personally. I do take supplements that contain this. Uh, Paula says, I rock. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> um, is it okay to eat eggs every day? I do. I eat eggs every day. Do you have to worry about the cholesterol levels? No, you don't. It is, uh, you, the concern about consuming cholesterol, um, if you try to not consume cholesterol, your liver will make additional cholesterol to compensate for that. Um, the cholesterol you eat through your diet contributes very little, in fact, to your blood levels of cholesterol. Um, I eat eggs with the yolks every day and um, that's fine. Um, how do I know if I show that CoQ10? Sorry, I don't understand that question. Um, let's see, Paula says that Nancy asked in the group chat, what do you recommend for cognitive function? Oh, autism, that's, it, there's different questions. So a cod liver oil versus omega-3, what type of vitamins do you recommend? So um, although I do a lot of work about cognitive function in terms of dementia prevention, I'm not an expert in autism. Although every brain tends to benefit from omega-3 essential fatty acids. And again, you know, given with, with cod liver oil, 
depend, it really depends on the formula. They are all great sources of omega-3s, even though they're often good sources of, um, as I mentioned, vitamins A and D. So I tend to lean towards omega-3 essential fatty acids, like a fish oil, standard fish oil, but uh, better to speak to a, an autism expert. Can I take mitochondrial supplement on a daily basis since I'm almost 67? Yes, absolutely. This is um, often when we, we need it, right? When we want to support our mitochondria the most. Um, question from Kin saying, if taking, how long should one continue? But I'm lost. I don't know what that refers to. Uh, question is, what is a good curcumin product to help reduce inflammation? Great question. There's lots of curcumin products on the market, but they are absolutely um, vary quite a bit in terms of absorption, which is super important. Um, the natural factors, what's called curcumin rich or thericurmin, has the most number of published clinical trials behind it uh, in terms of absorption, inflammation, blood levels, these kinds of things. So that's the one I tend to go with for that reason. How much vitamin D is optional, or, or excuse me, optimal? Does the sun give us enough? So, uh, well, definitely in the winter time, and even at this time of year, we're not getting enough vitamin D from the sun. You have, depending on where you live and how much time you're spending in the sun, you stand a chance to get decent vitamin D um, like midsummer. But in Canada, most of the year round, um, we just can't get enough of it from the sun. But how much do we need to take really varies per person? You know, most people, I would say you you want about 2000 international units as a minimum dose, but at some point it's nice to have a blood test. You can ask for this from your doctor. You will have to pay out of pocket for it. It's about $40 uh, to see whether the vitamin D you're taking, it just, it's quite unpredictable. For some people you get into the, uh, a therapeutic amount and some you're it's still very low. So that also speaks to the next question, how much vitamin K2 and D3, how much do you recommend again? It, it really varies depending on the individual. Ideally, at some point you get a blood test, but 2000 um, I use per day for uh, vitamin D is, is nice, especially in the winter time. You can probably get away with a thousand in the summer if you're uh, making some effort at sun exposure. Uh, and along with that, um, you can be taking for general health maintenance, 100 micrograms of vitamin K2, people with bone health, you want to double that to 200 micrograms roughly is what the studies are looking at and people with uh, known heart health issues or calcifications again can double that uh, good vitamin multivitamin for 38 year olds women again the whole earth and sea line of multis uh, are nice for depending on your um, gender and um, you know under or over 50 i like those the whole earth and sea is a nice option how do I know if I should take CoQ10 and how long should I continue to take it? Well, again, a CoQ10 is one of these nutrients that we might have or used to get in through our diet when we were eating a lot more organ meats, which is very uncommon now. Heart in particular is one of the highest known, uh, like a beef heart, for example. Um, and so, but it's a nutrient that if you are taking a statin cholesterol lowering medication, you absolutely need a CoQ10 supplement. And other than that, it is for um, optimizing mitochondrial function energy. So if your energy is low, it's definitely an important nutrient to consider. Um, let me see. Um, so there's a, another question about uh, recommending over-the-counter vitamin vitamins for improving memory. Um, and there's lots of those and, and we would need a whole other uh, webinar to talk about those. And maybe it's time to have another webinar about cognitive function, memory. Um, that's a good one. B12 is certainly an important one. And, and that's a good place to start. Um, but there are other nutrients, omega-3s are, are other ones um, to start. Uh, but there are lots of other ones that we could we could talk about phosphatidylserine, um, sort of so some of the some of the main ones. What supplements can you recommend to lower bad cholesterol? Um, I don't generally I'm not generally too concerned about so-called bad cholesterol. Uh, the LDL cholesterol is not really even bad until it becomes oxidized. Then it's a problem. So how do you prevent your 
cholesterol, good or bad, from becoming oxidized. Curcumin that I already mentioned, the thericurmin, fantastic antioxidant that will protect cholesterol from oxidizing. And you know many different antioxidants, but the curcumin is a big one. Um, should everyone take CoQ10? Can CoQ10 take, be taken indefinitely or long-term? Yes. Uh, comment here, rule of thumb, uh, Paula I've, says, I've heard that if your shadow is longer than you, then the sun's vitamin D is not penetrating the Earth's atmosphere. Hmm, yeah, that could very well be the case. Yes, we need, like, if vitamin D happens um, in addition to the height of the summer, but in the middle of the day, not, not just all day long in the summer as well. Okay, uh, let me just see here. Please run a class for improving memory. Okay, if more people are interested in that, then feel free to put that note in and we will consider that because I think it's an important question. My dad had Alzheimer's, so it's a topic I'm very personally interested in. Um, oh, correction from Paula, if your shadow is, if your shadow is smaller than the actual object, no vitamin D absorption. Well, we do know that we're not getting a lot. Um, Question from Shimin. Can curcumin cause internal bleeding? No, not generally. Although uh, the one area where we say proceed with caution is for people with active colitis, for example. Uh, so those, that's areas where they, the, there may be uh, basically raw or uh, ulcerated areas uh, in the gastrointestinal tract, in the colon in particular, but you can see similar areas elsewhere in the, uh, in the GI tract. So then you wanna proceed with caution when it comes to curcumin, because that can be irritating, but uh, no, it is not known to cause internal uh, bleeding. Okay, lots of people saying they would like a memory class. <clears throat> what type of B vitamin do you recommend? Um, I like there, and there are active B complexes. So when we take vitamins in either through our food or supplements, we don't use them immediately in the forms that they're found in food. Uh, our liver needs to convert them through one or more steps to activated forms. You can get those forms pre-converted uh, in a supplement. So uh, for example, Natural Factors has an active B complex as it's called or biocoenzymated B complex. Um, I like those uh, Bs myself. Okay, so that's all the questions in the q and I'm gonna shut the Q&A and I'm just gonna go look briefly over to the chat because I do see there are a few comments in there. They may have already been repeated in the Q&A. Um, and then I'll wrap up with that since it's already nine o'clock. Uh, let's see. Okay, so what's the difference between CoQ10 and ubiquinol? This is a question from Amanda. Um, so there are, CoQ10 comes in two different forms, ubiquinol and ubiquinone. Um, so this depends on whether it's what we call oxidized or reduced. Maybe basically one has an extra electron uh, hanging on to it and one doesn't. So one has an extra electron that it can donate, um, allowing it to become a um, potentially a, a you know, um, free radical fighter. One has an extra electron it can pick up. And so in fact, in the body, these two forms convert from one to the other as they throw and catch electrons, you could say ubiquinone and ubiquinol convert to one another. And so they are different forms of the same thing. Um, you can get ubiquinol supplements. Uh, this is what's called a reduced form. So it is a little bit more effective. I would say ubiquinol is about 25% more effective than regular CoQ10, uh, but it's also usually a little bit more expensive. So if you can afford it, um, you know, then, fine, go for the ubiquinol. Um, you can get to the same place with ubiquinone. Uh, it's a little bit less expensive, uh, but you also need to take a little more. So that's sort of how those two um, line up. I would say ubiquinol is, is premium, um, but you also get great benefits with the standard CoQ10. Does acupuncture help in relieving stress leading to feeling more energetic and vital? It sure does. I love my acupuncturist and uh, it absolutely is a wonderful treatment. Is it safe to take 
too much of omega threes. That's a funny question because by definition, I think too much isn't safe. But <laughs> to, to speak to your question, um, uh, you you don't really need more than I can't think of really very many cases of anybody, and these are rare cases that would need more than much more than two grams or maybe three grams. Uh, you know, so three thousand milligrams per day, and there are rare cases of individuals, biohackers who are taking like 25 grams of omega-3s a day and it didn't work out well for them. So I would say, yes, there's too much, such a thing as too much omega-3, but you really have to be making an effort to, you know, drinking this stuff. Uh, answer on the good multivitamin I recommended was the whole earth and sea line, comes in a green box with flowers and plants. Whole earth and sea has nice multis for men, women, under and over the age of 50. Just want to check what notes I'm getting here. Okay. Let's see. Um, is there a problem with consuming too much protein per day? Uh, it, it's really very difficult to do. Um, if once you calculate what your protein needs are, uh, you'll realize it's almost impossible to eat too much of it because it's hard to get to those levels. Liver, kidneys, no. So for people who have low kidney function, uh, already existing kidney disease, they need to be cautious about their protein intake because that can be tough on the kidneys for those individuals. For people with healthy kidneys, higher protein intake is associated with continuing kidney health. So that's how that um, uh, sort of lines up. What vitamins do you recommend to heal the gut? There's lots of things that can help heal the gut. Um, you know, the very first thing that comes to mind is not a vitamin, but an amino acid, which is L-glutamine. Uh, L-glutamine is a nice gut healer. Um, let's see. My wife asked me to ask you, um, what is the best treatment for dry throat? White trash and dry throat. Um, I'm not sure if I understand that one exactly. Sorry, I'm not clear on that. Uh, how about quercetin? Oh, I'm a big fan of quercetin. It's a bioflavonoid um, that helps. It's not the first thing I think of in terms of energy production, to be honest, quercetin. It's a nutrient that's important for blood vessel health. It's also a great antioxidant. I wouldn't necessarily call that an energy booster per se. The other nutrients I mentioned tonight, I think of as more energy boosters. Um, from Kim, amazing presentation. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we'll be offering a talk on hormones anytime soon. We hadn't planned on it. If, if that's something that people are interested in, then we can consider that. Um, is there a test to know if you need a mitochondrial supplement? Not really. I can't really say that, that there is a great test. Uh, maybe there are specific individual ones you can get at a practitioner um, for mitochondrial function. Let's see, what could cause a lower amount of omega-6? I'm not sure uh, what that means, whether there's been some kind of blood test that shows omega-6. Usually um, a lower amount would be due to low intake. Uh, what do you recommend for nerve support? That's typically B vitamins, all the B vitamins, but especially B3, B6, B12. They uh, help with neurological and nervous function, all the Bs uh, are really important for nerve support. Uh, is it safe to take that mitochondrial drink if on other medications? It has a very few um, medication interactions. They're not common medications, but those are listed on the label of the product. I don't have them off the top of my head. Okay, and I think that wraps up all the questions. Most comments are coming in are great, thank you, which means that it's time for people to sign off. Oh, one last one about how we can support liver health. Um, lemon water in the morning uh, and liver loving herbs, things like milk thistle, for example, artichoke, um, these kinds of herbs will help the liver do their job, but as well the curcumin that I mentioned, the theracurmin, curcumin rich, uh, really very nice for liver health. Okay, thanks everyone. I know we're past time here. We've got, thank you for all the great questions. And I believe that everybody who signed up will get a copy or recording, or this will in fact be posted. Healthy Planet uh, does post this 
uh, I think on their YouTube channel pretty soon. So thanks everyone for your time and interest and have a good night.